this is concurrent session. Okay. Welcome to the IAA International Conference, first on 9-1. This is concurrent session 96, climate change mitigation case studies. We have three very interesting and challenging presentations for this session. Uh, let's start from the first one. The first paper is titled Comparison of Carbon Footprints, Digital Currency, Bitcoin, and Gold. Determination of the Critical Exchange Rate. Dr. Kurkem Uturk of Izmir University of Economics, Turkey, will present on behalf of two authors. Kurkem, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are. Uh, it's very nice to be here in front of such a distinguished audience today. Uh, as uh, indicated the title of my speech is comparison of carbon footprints of digital currency and gold determination of the critical exchange rate i'm an associate professor at the school of engineering of Izmir university of economics and uh, my esteemed colleague mr payar <clears throat> janunwar works uh, at the credit bureau of Turkey. Here is the outline uh, for today's speech. I will uh, first explain the motivation for our uh, study, why we decided to investigate the environmental impact of uh, digital currency and why we chose Bitcoin. Then I will uh, talk about the methodology that we followed in our study, which is life cycle assessment or shortly LCA, which will be followed by a discussion on the results uh, and their implications. We have two main sets of results in this work, uh, the carbon footprint values of Bitcoin and gold separately and the critical exchange rate, which is the main uh, result of this work. And at the end of the presentation, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. The presentation will last uh, about um, 15 minutes max. And uh, I guess we will have plenty of time for the questions to answer session afterwards. Okay, this uh, graph, which has been taken from a recently published scientific paper, uh, shows the uh, number of cryptocurrencies in circulation uh, over the last few years. And as you can clearly see, there is a very sharp and continuous increase in the cryptocurrency market. So this is a growing market and it will keep growing. So when we want to investigate this market, we believe the best way to do that is to focus on Bitcoin. There are several uh, cryptocurrencies, but Bitcoin by far uh, has the largest share in the market. As you can see in this pie chart, it accounts for approximately 30% of the total cryptocurrency market. And that is why we decided to go with Bitcoin in our study. Now, recently there has been a lot of discussion about the yeah. environmental impacts of Bitcoin mining. In this uh, figure, it's uh, indicated that if Bitcoin were a country, it would be the 29th country in the world in terms of annual energy consumption. That is a very high value. And as if these concerns were not enough, recently, the world famous businessman, Elon Musk, stated in a tweet that his company, Tesla, would stop accepting Bitcoin as a financial means of transaction because of the high environmental footprint and low sustainability of Bitcoin. So this tweet was sent after we decided to uh, work on this topic. If you look at the date, it says the 13th of May and the deadline uh, for the presentation submission in this conference was uh, way earlier. So it has been a Nice coincidence because, um, unfortunately, scientists talking about the issue is one thing. A world famous businessman bringing it up is something else. It has much higher uh, impact on the society. So Bitcoin and its environmental impact is a very hot topic nowadays. But not everyone thinks that Bitcoin is environmentally hazardous. For example, the uh, uh, people who prepared this graph argue that Compared to other means of financial transactions, such as uh, currency printing or gold mining, Bitcoin has much lower energy consumption on a global and annual basis. And therefore, it doesn't have as much environmental impact as the other uh, currencies. But all this discussion 
leads to one simple question, actually. When we make such comparisons between Bitcoin or currency or gold, what is our functional unit? Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the concept of functional unit, I think the best way to explain is to give this uh, daily life example. Here on the screen, you see two uh, hand drying options that we come across in public toilets. On the left hand side, you see an electrical hand dryer, and on the right hand side, you see a paper towel dispenser. One uses electricity, the other uses paper towel. So if you want to compare these two from an economic or environmental point of view, how would we do that? Their initial costs would be different. Their operation mechanisms are different. So the only way these two can be compared would be in terms of their functions, which is drying hands. So the technical definition of functional unit is a quantified description of the function of a product that serves as a reference basis for all calculations regarding impact assessment. So if we combine all those concerns uh, about the environmental impact, the relative environmental impact of Bitcoin and this definition, then we can uh, get to the point that we wanted uh, to focus on. In this study, we compared Bitcoin and gold production in terms of their uh, environmental impacts per functional unit. And what can be the functional unit of these two? There is only one functional unit, their purchasing value. So we calculated the environmental impacts of Bitcoin and gold per unit value, and then we compared those two. All other comparisons, like the ones that we have seen earlier, are meaningless. At this stage, you may wonder why we only focus on Bitcoin and gold, why we left printed currency aside. That is because the way we define the functional units, the environmental footprint of $1 bill and a $100 bill would be identical. Therefore, making a comparison would become meaningless, and that is why we only focus on gold and Bitcoin. Okay, now we can proceed with the details of our methodology. As I have already mentioned earlier, we used life cycle assessment methodology or shortly LCA. This methodology is used to assess the environmental and also in some cases economic and social impacts associated with all the stages of the life cycle of a commercial product, process or service. A typical life cycle assessment study takes the following stages into account raw material acquisition, production, storage, if it's applicable, use or operation, and end-of-life treatment. In this work, we use a freeware called CCALC, which has been developed in the University of Manchester. And I was lucky enough to be a part of the team that developed CCALC. I worked at the University of Manchester. I also had my PhD in the University of Manchester, but it was way before CCALC was developed, and years later, I worked there as part of my sabbatical as a visiting academic uh, in the fall of 2016. And during that time, I was a tester for CCOG. So I have been involved in the uh, development stages. It's a very uh, useful, very easy to use software. And we use CCOG in our analysis. Here you can see its main screen, the user interface. And we consider the following inputs. For Bitcoin mining, the electronic components and the electricity required, obviously. And for gold mining, we considered all the material and energy inputs as well as the transportation of gold. It is very important to consider the location of mining when it comes to Bitcoin, because as you probably uh, would appreciate, different locations have different electricity mixes and the uh, resources that are uh, in the electricity mix would determine the overall impact of Bitcoin. That is why we decided to repeat the same analysis in four different locations. These are Turkey, simply because uh, we are from Turkey and this study was conducted in Turkey. And the other three countries were chosen because of the fact that their energy mixes 
are dominated by one type of resource. In the case of Poland, it is coal. The total, uh, more than 75% of the total electricity supply of Poland comes from coal. In the case of Denmark, this is renewables. And in the case of France, this is nuclear energy. Again, almost 75% of France's uh, energy supply comes from nuclear power plants. So we wanted to see how the uh, carbon footprint of Bitcoin would change when we mine it in different locations. Okay, enough said, let's proceed with the results. Here, you will see the first set of our results. There are six columns in this figure. The first four show the carbon footprint of Bitcoin mining in different locations. The first one is in Turkey, then Poland, then France, and then Denmark. The fifth column shows what would the, what, uh, would the uh, carbon footprint of Bitcoin mining be if all the energy required for the process came from photovoltaic panels, which is the cleanest technology available. And finally, the rightmost column you can see is the environmental impact of gold production per unit value. And as you can see, the environmental impact of Bitcoin is way higher, even in the cleanest scenario, compared to gold production. And here is our main result. The title of our study uh, is, after all, the critical exchange rate. So what should the value of Bitcoin be so that Bitcoin and gold production would have identical carbon footprints per unit value? Depending on the location or the uh, quality of the energy mix, obviously the answer would change. But if you look at the value that corresponds to the photovoltaic panels, it says approximately $196,000. That is how expensive Bitcoin should be so that its environmental impact or its carbon footprint would become equal to that of gold. Now, when we check the price of Bitcoin historically, we see that the highest ever price it has reached is around $60,000. And recently it has uh, decreased significantly, mostly because of uh, those remarks made by Elon Musk that I have mentioned before. So therefore, we can conclude that under the current conditions, and if we define the environmental impact in terms of carbon footprint only, we can say that Bitcoin is actually environmentally hazardous. So what can we do about it, what to do? Currently, Bitcoin market or cryptocurrency market in general is not a regulated market, but we believe that it should be, and Bitcoin transactions should be subject to a carbon tax, or if there is no regulations, then companies should start taking uh, the matter into their own hands, and they should stop accepting Bitcoin as a valid means of financial transaction, exactly what Elon Musk has done. So uh, the last thing that I would like to say before finishing the presentation is uh, what can be done to improve this work? First of all, obviously we uh, could study more locations, but I think uh, four locations were enough to give you a general idea about how sensitive Bitcoin production is uh, the carbon footprint of Bitcoin pr production is to the location. So the actual uh, improvement can come by making the comparison, not only in terms of the carbon footprint, but rather in terms of a more generally defined environmental footprint. We chose carbon footprint because it is definitely the most popular uh, environmental impact nowadays. When you say carbon footprint, engineers, economists, uh, people in, in any, any discipline would have an idea about what it is. But Bitcoin mining, and more importantly, gold mining, have several other environmental impacts as well. If we give some examples, the land transformation uh, as a result of deforestation for gold mining is one impact. Human toxicity potential as a result of the use of cyanide for leaching in gold mines is another. And photochemical smoke formation, which is a fancy name uh, for air pollution during the 
a correlation of fault from the point of mining to the point of uh, processing or storage is another impact. These examples can be increased. We can add uh, acidification, eutrophication, uh, several other ecotoxicity, several other impacts, but these are less known. Many people would not have an idea about those. For instance, when I say photochemical smoke formation, uh, it wouldn't ring a bell for many uh, participants of this conference. But when I say carbon footprint, people understand what I'm talking about. So that is why we made that choice. But what we can do in the future is we can define an overall environmental impact by assigning weights to these individual impacts by obviously uh, taking the opinions of uh, stakeholders. And then we can uh, make a more accurate comparison. OK. That's all I would like to say for today. I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here and listening to my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions about any aspect of this work, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is indeed a very interesting presentation. Uh, we have one question uh, from uh, Regina Betts uh, says, do you know where the most of Bitcoin is mined? This will allow you to get closer to the real value and asks who would be the regulatory body, who could be the, you know, the regulatory body for a carbon tax on Bitcoin? Well, uh, regarding the first question, uh, I think it's uh, Mongolia uh, ch uh, and China. Those are the main uh, two countries in which uh, Bitcoin is uh, mined. Well, uh, the reason that we did not include these two countries in our analysis is simply because of a lack of data. I mean, uh, the database that we have in our freeware, CCALC, does not have an up-to-date data about the energy mix of China, unfortunately. The data belongs to 2002. That is why we, I, I, we didn't want to go through with that. Uh, it belongs to almost 20 years ago. And there was absolutely no data about the uh, uh, electricity mix of Mongolia. That is why we could not uh, include those two countries in our analysis. But I believe, I mean, we know uh, that, especially in China, coal and hydropower are the two main uh, sources of energy supply. So I, I'm 100% sure that the environmental impact would not be lower. It would be somewhere maybe in between Poland and the other countries. So it would definitely be higher. And regarding the second question, uh, I believe uh, it should be uh, a nation, national issue. I mean, uh, different countries can have different laws, different regulations. But if a country is serious about uh, limiting the carbon footprint, then I think uh, there must be some sort of regulation about digital currency. In Turkey, uh, it is very popular. Actually, I have recently read an analysis, I think on, uh, it was on Twitter, uh, that on a per capita basis, Turkey is the first country in the world uh, in terms of uh, digital currency ownership. So many people own digital currency in Turkey. Most of the time, this uh, currency is not mined in Turkey. We just buy it, we don't uh, mine it, but still we create a demand. And whenever there is demand, there will be supply. So Turkey has a huge responsibility in that sense. And I believe the Turkish government should look into this issue. Thank you. We have actually a second question from Yu Tang Yang. Uh, I believe it's about uh, the data that you use for to, to calculate the Bitcoin mining carbon footprint. It uh, says, are you using the average electricity or the marginal electricity? I average. believe what it means is marginal cost or marginal price or something. Uh, I was yeah. told the same thing about the price of four countries, or would it be the average of 10 years or something like that? This, this is not an economic analysis. So the, uh, this uh, basically does not in, involve any sort of economic analysis, and the price of electricity is not a parameter here. But uh, as far as the input to the environmental uh, life cycle model is concerned, we use the Average electricity, basically we uh, get how much electricity was produced in that country over a year and how much of it comes from this, how much of it comes from that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you look at this instantly, 
these ratios can change. Some days of the year, uh, maybe more than 90% of the energy can come from renewables, especially in the case of Denmark. And then in some case of this, some days of the year, more than 90% of the energy in Poland can come from coal. But we look at the average annual values when we made this analysis. But I repeat, there is no uh, economic analysis in this work. Thank you. Uh, 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 do you have any uh, idea about the prices of four countries that you uh, did your analysis? The prices of electricity, you mean? Yeah, usually uh, the you know the newspaper says that, you know low low electricity price is one of the reasons why people uh, do mining in Mongolia, Kazakhstan, China, so on and so forth. Well, yeah, to be honest, I don't have uh, information on that uh, topic, the relative electricity prices uh, between those four countries and uh, Mongolia or China, uh, but I, uh, I'm, I assume, as you have said yourself, uh, it would, the main reason that people choose these locations uh, is because of the low price of electricity, but lo low price and environmental impacts obviously usually do not go hand in hand. So. Uh, I'm, I'm also uh, pretty sure that uh, the impacts of mining Bitcoin in those countries would be much higher than the, these four, at least three of these four. I believe so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions and for your interest. Uh, have a nice session. OK, now we go to the next paper for this session. The second paper title is Updating the Value of Lost load for the for the optimal decarbonization of heat and power system in the UK. Uh, presenter would be Ms. Matilda Bazani, if I'm right for the presentation, of the University of Cambridge. Uh, Matilda, please. Uh, Gorkim, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, well, hello everyone, and thank you uh, for the introduction. So I am Mathilde Fajaldi, a research associate at the University of Cambridge, and I will present the results of a study we recently carried out in Great Britain on domestic value of loss load. So let's start by some definition. Um, so when planning for future power systems, there are two costs to consider. You first have the cost of ensuring the security of electricity supply by building, for example, generation and transmission capacity. So that's the green curve on the right. And that cost like, naturally increases with the level of security. And the second sort of cost element is the damage cost to the economy, which results from interruptions in the power supply, which increases as the level of security decreases. And that's the red curve on the graph. And so regulators, energy regulators, when they plan for optimal systems, they seek for a compromise or they seek a compromise between these two costs. And that is typically represented by the value of loss load or what we also call vol. Uh, so that corresponds to this compromise and is measured in pound per megawatt hour of electricity lost. And the reason we're talking about vol is that as a result of tightening CO2 emissions reduction target on the economy, we see an increasing share of renewable electricity in the grid, as well as prospects of electrification of other demands such as transport and heating. And that could pose you know, uh, significant challenging, uh, challenges to the grid. So maintaining traditional standards of vol might become more and more costly in this deeply decarbonized system. So how to determine the vol? So this is a representation of the literature landscape. Um, there are two, basically two main approaches to measure vol. You either have indirect methods, which use production functions. Uh, so this is the green frame on the left here. Um, and then you have direct survey-based methods, which is the yellow frame. And so survey-based method will basically use either contingent valuation. So they will mm -hmm. ask respondents directly to provide how much they would be willing to pay to avoid or willing to accept to compensate for interruptions in power supply. And then you have discrete choice experiments, which are also, which are also survey, but in a DCE or discrete choice experiment, respondents are asked to make repeated choices between two electricity systems 
which have different features. For example, they will have to make a choice between a system with a, where the frequency of interruptions is you know, once every 12 years and between a system where the frequency of interruption is once every four years, for example. Uh, the duration of interruptions might vary as well, as well as how much they would be paying to avoid or how much they would be, how much they would be receiving as a compensation for electricity supply interruptions. And so as you see in this very small yellow frame, there are actually very few explicit role studies based on discrete choice experiments and none for the UK since 2013. Uh, there is, however, a wider category of studies, which we call willingness to pay studies, which use discrete choice experiment to elicit willingness to pay to avoid and or to accept compensation for electricity supply interruptions. And few of these studies, so that's the blue frame here, but actually few of these studies, however, include the share of renewable in the grid or the emissions reduction potential as a potential feature. Uh, renewable or emissions is still included in a different category of studies, that's the gray frame here, uh, which is basically, which are basically willingness to pay studies that look at a wide range of different features of electricity, electricity supply. So respondents will be asked to choose between systems where uh, with different electricity mix, for example, or type of company, you know, whether the company is local or national, uh, type of service contract, type, type of tariffing, uh, infrastructure impacts, etc. And so what do we currently use as vol in the UK? Uh, the UK energy regulator Optum last assessed the role of domestic, commercial and industrial consumers uh, in 2013 using a discrete choice experiment approach, which, um, which I just explained. And, 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 and they currently use an average annual vol for both domestic and commercial consumers. So that's the value that they use uh, in planning for the optimal electricity system. However, if we look at recent literature, uh, some study shows that a more segmented and time varying representation of vol in energy systems model could really help lower the operational cost of power systems. And in that study in particular, they showed that we could lower the operational cost of power systems by 40% if we had a more segmented and time varying vol in these systems. And we also have no evidence on how people's perception of electricity supply security might evolve as we get, as we get more renewable electricity in the grid. In other words, would, would people be willing to, um, uh, ready to have more interruptions or more frequent interruptions in their power supply if they were provided, if the electricity they were provided with was cleaner? And so um, still on the literature on renewable integration, there are some studies on willingness to pay for renewable electricity. There are actually a lot of, of studies like this. They just don't focus on security of supply. Um, in the UK context, only one willingness to, willingness to pay study has included emissions reduction as an attribute and showed that it was the most important choice attribute for respondents. So it is very important to consider both security and supply and renewable electricity um, together in a DCE. Among the wider literature on features of electricity supply in general, um, they show that in general, respondents are willing to pay a premium for renewable electricity generation or emissions reduction in high income countries, uh, though that premium is typically lower than the actual cost of integrated renewables in the grid. So the relationship between uh, willingness to pay and renewable integration is also interesting. Um, a willingness to pay study from 2000 in the US showed that the willingness to pay didn't increase linearly with renewable integration. Uh, actually, the slope was decreasing as more renewable was integrated into the grid, which suggests that people care about the concept of renewable, but not really about having substantial renewable in the grid. Or in other words, that they care about renewable integration up to a certain point. And finally, that was only observed in higher income countries. In lower income countries, the focus was more on electrification and electricity access than renewable integration. And so with this literature context in mind, uh, the aim of this study is first to examine the extent to which the role of Great Britain households has evolved since 2013 by emulating the same method used by the UK energy regulator back then. We also aim at determining if vol might be impacted by an increasing share of renewable in the grid. Are, are people willing to pay uh, less to avoid interruptions if the grid is cleaner. 
And we also wish to provide insights into how vol might vary across different population segments in the UK. So an important point is that our study does not enable the determination of a new vol for the UK regulator, as we only focused on domestic consumers, we don't cover industrials or commercial consumers. And we also use internet-based serving methods, not as opposed to you know, phone call or door-to-door -door visits, which may underrepresent fully connected areas. In terms of methods, we carried out a survey in January 2020 and gathered 3,016 households uh, to reply. Uh, the survey was structured into different sections. So we asked people about their housing characteristics, uh, attitudes toward energy, uh, you know, do they know about uh, energy supply and energy consumption, um, environmental concern and knowledge, uh, social demographics, and then the, the, the vol DCE specifically, uh, so people are, are being asked with, to choose between two electricity systems and the choices vary uh, depend on, depending on duration of interruption, frequency of interruption, season of interruption, time of day of interruption, and the share of renewable in the grid. Uh, some a few more words on methods. So they, there are important choices to be made when designing a DCE. First, obviously the attributes of the DCE and their levels. So in order to emulate Ofgem DCE from 2013, we first designed a discrete choice experiment with the same attributes and level uh, than Ofgem and that we performed that DCE on half of the respondents. And to explore the importance of renewable integration, which was not considered back then, uh, but we want to explore that as an attribute, but we don't want to have uh, too high of a number of, uh, um, too high a number of attributes. We then designed another DCE on the other half of respondents uh, where we will replace the season of interruption by the level of renewable integration in the grid. Another important choice is whether the DC is formulated as willingness to pay to avoid or willingness to accept compensation. Typically in the liter literature, we see that people want to receive a much higher compensation for interruptions than they are willing to pay to avoid, which is referred to as the loss of version bias. Uh, so it's important to, to, to be careful in the formulation. So following of the methodology, out of the eight choice cards that each respondent sees, half of the choice cards were formulated as willingness to pay, and half of the choice cards were formulated as willingness to accept. And then we can see the difference involved based on the two formulations. A third key aspect of DCE to be careful about is the status quo bias. Uh, that's the fact that respondents will prefer to keep their current systems, especially when it comes to interruptions in the power supply. I mean, people want their current level of, st of steady power supply. Uh, while some studies include a keep my existing system option, we decided not to include this option and effectively force a choice between two systems which are basically not as good as the current system, but still include the don't know option to avoid ill-informed choices. And in terms of model, we use a mixed logic model to capture heterogeneity in respondents valuation and then perform the model in willingness to pay space to analyze the distribution of willingness to pay and value of loss load. And finally, heterogeneity was explored with interactions between the price and duration attributes with respondents covariates. Uh, this is an example of choice card for the season version. So you can see that people have to make a choice between system A and system B. Uh, they will differ by the duration of the duration of interruptions, the time of day, is it peak of off peak, the frequency of interruption, is it one every two years, one every four years, or one every, once every 12 years, uh, the season of interruption, is it winter or off winter, this matters if people have electrical heating, for example, um, the price to pay to avoid interruption, and then they, they, they make the choice between these systems. And for the renewable version, this is the same card, but half of the respondents uh, have uh, the share of renewable instead of um, the season of interruption. And so moving on to some results. So we first explored the results of VOL based on willingness to pay choice cards for the season DC. And so we compare these with off-gem results. So we're first interesting to, interested to see how might has the VOL and might have the, how the VOL might have evolved since 2013. So this graph shows vol for different frequency of interruptions, uh, once every two years, once every, once every four years, once every 12 years, uh, different time of day, off peak or peak time, and time of year, winter or off winter. 
the error bar is represented in 95% intervals and the blue bars correspond to the off-gen results. So, and the bottom line also indicates whether the value was statistically different from zero. And as means not statistically significant and stars indicate the level of statistical significance. So we see that overall results are remarkably close to the off-gen results for the statistically significant cases, as you can see here and here. Uh, this is somewhat surprising, as you might expect a variation since 2013, but it also confirms the robustness of the DCE approach to assess domestic vol. In terms of drivers of vol, frequency uh, is the main, um, which was actually not including, included in the main DCE in the OpGem study, is found to be the strongest driver of vol, which suggests that domestic vol could drastically increase should the blackout standard for the electricity grid decrease. Uh, currently, the standard is once every 12 years, but it shows that if we decrease the standard to once every four years or once every two years, the vol could, could significantly increase. Uh, finally, whether the interruption occurs at peak times or not also impacts the vol, but to a lesser extent. And the season of interruption, however, is found to have no, no statistical significant impact, no statistically significant impact on vol. Um, now we compare the vol based on willingness to pay formulation with the vol based on willingness to accept formulation. And we also compare that with the off-gem uh, off uh, results. We find similar trends for the vol results based on willingness to pay choice cards uh, or willingness to accept choice cards, sorry. We also find large dif differences between uh, willingness to pay based vol and willingness to accept based vol. On average, respondents are willing to accept much higher compensation than they are willing to pay to avoid one. It's between 1.3 and 5.9 times more. And that's in line with the off 2013 willingness to pay, uh, willingness to accept ratio, as well as other studies which typically show much larger willingness to accept than willingness to pay. And so we now move to the other half of the respondent pool which received a different version of the DCE where the season of interruption was replaced with the share of renewable in the grid, either 50%, 90%, or 99%. Uh, this graph shows vol for different frequency, time of day, and renewable integration. Again, with the level of significance in the bottom. One clear conclusion is that respondents value greater share of renewable electricity in the grid and are ready to accept or pay for a lower standard of electricity supply to increase this share, and that's that's quite important. In particular, vol, as you can see, vol for interruptions occurring during peak time here every four years, but with 90% uh, renewable integration is lower than that for one occurring every 12 years, but with a 50% renewable grid. So this showed that should outage frequency increase with increasing demand for electricity services and integration of renewable electricity in the grid, domestic vol would not necessarily increase and could even decrease because of that, but, um, of people's perception of renewable electricity. A second observation is about the relationship between vol and renewable in the grid. Um, a, uh, respondents roughly linearly value the integration of renewable electricity, which is represented in this graph. This constitutes a significant evolution from studies two decades ago that showed respondents only valued greater integration of renewable electricity up to a certain point. It is worth noting, however, that the cost of integrating renewable electricity in the grid is very much nonlinear. So this, um, with the slope increasing as the of renewable electricity nears 100%. So while renewable integration could offer opportunities to lower grid security standards, it will not likely be enough to cover the cost of full renewable integration. And finally, we explored what were the main drivers of heterogeneity among respondents. Um, so this table shows how vol varies across different segments. We have age, so age one means uh, respondents younger than 25 years old, age five respondents older than 65 years old. Uh, we also have higher income respondents, high inc. Um, and finally, respondents which produce their own electricity, own elec. And so these were, the factors that seem to um, explain most of the uh, variation in, in the variance in the distribution of vol and willingness to pay. 
um, overall, we found that uh, older and higher income respondents were willing to pay more to avoid blackouts. Um, and people producing their own electricity, even though it's a very small fraction of the respondents, about two or three percent, uh, was still quite statistically significant. And obviously, people who produce their own electricity have a lower role because they care, they care less about the security of electricity supply. And in the renewable version, we find the same drivers are true. We find that income and age are also the main drivers of heterogeneity, which confirms the robustness of the effect. Uh, interestingly, we find that the level of environmental concern, which was not statistically significant in the season version, um, is now a statistically significant in the renewable version. So the title should say renewable as opposed to season. Um, and, and we find in particular that um, uh, uh, that people with uh, high environmental concern have a lower role. So that suggests that increasing concern for environment might further reduce domestic role, which is also an important finding. So to conclude, I have two slides of conclusions to walk you through the different uh, findings of this study. So first, despite of dramatic changes in the electricity mix in the UK, over the past eight years and the adoption of a legally binding commitment to cut net emissions to zero, no study, no study has quantified the role for UK domestic consumers to account for this changing context since Ofgem did it in 2013. So we thought it was very important to, 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 to get that study out. Uh, in terms of findings, we find that willingness to pay to avoid and willingness to accept compensation for an interruption and the corresponding role are within the 95% confidence uh, interval of the Avgem study for a winter day at peak time with a once in a 12 year frequency. And so that, that was quite surprising that the results are so close. So we don't see a large evolution, we don't see an evolution since 2013, but that also confirms the robustness of the over this year approach to assess British domestic ball. Uh, unlike the Avgem study, however, the interruptions frequency was included as an attribute in the main DCE, and our results indicate that it is a key driver of vol, showing a linear relationship between vol and frequency. And so that suggests that vol could increase significantly should the low carbon transition increase blackout frequency. And that, that really highlights the need for studies on response, uh, responses to even higher blackout frequencies, for example, infra year, and the impact on domestic vol. Uh, no previous study has assessed the impact of expanding renewable electricity on domestic vol. Importantly, this study shows that domestic vol decreases linearly with renewable electricity integration or roughly linearly. Um, and that's unlike previous studies, which had claimed the households only value, including renewables up to a certain point. In particular, we found that vol for more frequent interruptions, so once in a four, once every four years on the cleaner grid with 90% renewable was lower than the vol for less frequent interruptions once every 12 years, which is the current standard, occurring on a grid with less renewable electricity um, of 50%. So the presence of renewable electricity in the grid could therefore potentially compensate for higher interruption of frequency um, on domestic vol. And finally, the main drivers of heterogeneity among respondents were the same across both DCEs, income and age. Overall, older and higher income respondents are willing to pay more to avoid blackouts. An explanation for this could be that most vulnerable and disconnected households are underrepresented in the survey population owing to the online serving method, um, but it's still an interesting driver. And interestingly, the level of environmental concern was only found statistically significant in the DCE featuring the share of renewable electricity as an attribute, which suggests that increasing concern for environmental um, and, and climate change uh, might further reduce domestic vol. Uh, thank you. With that, I will conclude. Uh, feel free to ask any questions either by email or live, and also I welcome any comments or feedback. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I actually have one question that this is for the uh, UK case study, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, what kind of recommendation can you give to the, uh, the 
the British uh, government, I guess, for this one. Go for go for more uh, uh, renewable for this one. I think our recommendation is really, you know, it's not about how how you need to change the system. You know, the system in terms of the capacity mix will change as a result of tightening CO2 emissions and you know, of, of a carbon price and, and, and that, that will follow its course. What our recommendation is, is really for the UK energy regulator to perhaps review the current standard as, as they are, um, but also you know, perhaps carry it out um, a, large, a larger scale uh, trial to evaluate how ball might, might vary across different segments of the population uh, to really sort of assess the robustness of our study. So what we want is really just to point out to the need of re reviewing the standard, showing that there's a clear potential for reduction of the standard given more renewable in the grid. Um, and, and that could offer opportunities to lower the cost of the grid, both operationally and from a capital cost point of view. Okay, oh, would there be any other questions? Actually in Korea, we have a pretty much same debate over here too. You know. In order to uh, use more renewable energy, you need to change your standard of all the grid system. If mm -hmm. you have a high standard for, you know, the loss of electricity, it's not easy to have more renewable energy within the grid system. Okay. Exactly. So that, that might be a very good. Uh, you know, we might want to do the same research over here in Korea too. I guess. There's actually a really good research from Korea from 2015 on that, and uh, and I think it's just that. Um, they didn't translate the willingness to pay into actual yeah. vols. So I think it's not an explicit vol study, but there is research on willingness to pay for renewable integration right. in Korea. Uh, I think I think most countries are looking into these these questions now. Thank you very uh, much. I yes, think there's just a question for from Regina on uh, the length of blackouts. I can see okay. the. Yes popping up. So I think there's a very good question. So the reason why I don't discuss the impact of length is because we consider the duration um, as a linear variable uh, that, that is needed. If you want to calculate vol, you need to, do, to divide the willingness to pay for different amounts of time divided by the consumption for that time. And so we considered for simplicity, the duration variable as linear. So basically the, the willingness to pay for 20 minutes, uh, you know, will be um, X times lower than the winners to pay for four hours um, and following a linear trend. So we don't have that nonlinear effect represented in the model, but it's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mathilde. Uh, we'll go for the finer uh, presentation of this session. Thank you. And it's about surfer hexafluoride. I, I believe it's right, SF6. The title is Benefit Cost Analysis of SF6 Emission Mitigation in the Power Industry. And I believe it's about Chinese case study. And the presenter would be Ms. Lin Jin Tong of Wuhan University. Uh, please, can you present your paper? Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction. And I'm now sharing my screen. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yeah, good. Um, and I will go for the first screen mode. And good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jing Tongling from Wuhan University. And today I'm going to present an ongoing project titled the Cost Benefit Analysis of Mitigating SF6 Emission in the Power Industry. This is co authored with Song Xiao, Yu Wei Li, also at Wuhan University. And Yu Bei and I are the senior students at Wuhan University, and with Yu Ting Yang at University of New Mexico, and with Yan Na Jing from Environmental Defense Fund. So first, the focus of our research as F6 is an inert gas that has outstanding isolation performance and excellent stability. However, SF6 is also known as one of the most potent greenhouse gases. From this paper, we can see that um, it not only has a global warming potential of over 23,000 times of carbon dioxide, but also a long lifetime in the atmosphere. Given its stability, SF6 is widely used in the power industry for electric isolation, and around 80% of its emission comes from the power industry. 
Specifically, SF6 is used in the gas isolated switchgear equipment, which is an essential component in the electric power system. Usually, GIS is composed of several intervals that uses SF6 as the isolation gas, and each interval emits SF6 during its life cycle. And this gas emission has become considerable as the GIS market shows rapid growth in that case due to the increasing electrification. Here we take China, for example, the number of GIS intervals shown by the purple bars has increased more than 20 times in the past two decades, which is in line with the increasing electricity consumption shown by the red line. And the emission of SF6 grows with this trend. Now the left figure gives us the SF6 stock and distribution in various voltage level GIS intervals. Over the past decades, and we can see that the 100 and 200 level voltages are the dominant ones. The dark blue area indicates that ultra high voltage transmission system, as well as its SF6 usage are also expanding rapidly. And sizable percentage of asset flips emits from this increasing GIS annually, showing the blue line. The actual scale of emission and mitigation we are talking about is less than 100 million ton carbon dioxide. And compared to other non carbon dioxide greenhouse gases, this is a relatively small scale. For example, the SF6 emission is about 10% of the annually mitigated HFC last year in China. But however, I think we must realize that this is just the CCIT amount and there are still plenty of GIS intervals that are in production and in need for a growing industry, which may uh, mitigating the emission of SF6 a potential topic. But perhaps due to its relatively small scale, on policy side, there are some outdated standards on promoting the mitigation of SF6. Also the enforcement and accountability were weak. Only recently, it becomes a high regulatory priority due to the carbon neutralization goals and SF6 standards are updated. In Chinatopoli, there are two potential solutions to mitigate SF6 emission from the GIS equipment. The first is to reduce the leakage and improve gas recycle during the decommissioning. Now, this solution requires low investment costs. It also requires strong enforcement that incurs high administrative costs. The second solution is to promote SF6 replacement with low carbon alternative gases. It is technically feasible because studies of alternative gases and devices are booming. For example, researchers and firms have already proved that the C4 gas mixture is the most suitable alternative gas to achieve the same level of performance as SF6. The disadvantage here is that it has huge investment costs. However, with the progress of technology, the cost is likely to reduce in the future. And our work focuses on the second solution. Up to now, uh, there is a large amount of literature focusing on the estimation and projection of SF6 emissions. Others focus on the technical analysis of alternative gases and equipment. To the best of our knowledge, no previous study has looked at the economic benefit of replacing SF6. And our work filled this gap by constructing a benefit cost analysis framework and analyze the social net benefit of mitigating SF6 with feasible real world solution. And apart from conducting our standard BCA, we also follow several recent studies that using more carol simulation based approaches to further inform the distribution of the net benefits. This method is a powerful tool to address the uncertainties in BCA, especially when it comes to studies looking at some future low carbon products or technical solutions where there are limited market information and lots of unknowns. And based on the Technical analysis of SF6 alternative and market survey, we summarize three replacement schemes for the BCA. So the first one is called the green investment. This scheme is the basic decision-making contest. It looks at the additional benefit of investing in a new GIS using C4 gases instead of using an old GIS using SF6. 
The second and third scheme deals with the replacement of the existing OGS. Scheme two equipment replacement means that if we want to mitigate the emission now, we can invest in a new JS and the old JS with SF6 will be retired uh, earlier than its design lifetime. And scheme three, gas replacement with ritual fitting. It means we ritual fit the old JS to make it compatible with the alternative gas. This scheme is promising as it saves equipment cost, but the ritual fitting technology is still at in the research and development stage. For these three schemes, we build a BCA framework and their benefits and costs are summarized in this table. During the different life cycle stage of GIS, we consider different components of private or social costs and benefits. And then we calculate the net benefit for a representative GIS in turbo and use the net benefit value as the value criteria. The main benefit component, the social benefit, is defined as the social benefit of avoided SF6 emissions minus the social cost of C4 emissions from one GIS interval during the life cycle. In the equation, the life cycle emission is the aggregate uh, emission during production and uh, installation, operation and maintenance, and finally decommission. And this benefit depends on several parameters, especially the social cost of carbon and the gas recycle rate during the decommission. In fact, this BCA framework can be applied to a wide range of contests. Here, only for illustration, we conduct a case study for China. And China provides a good empirical contest due to its high political priority to reach the carbon neutralization and we are familiar with the technical details about gas and equipments in China. Then among several alternative gases, we choose the C4 mixture. And then we collect our data for dozens of parameters, including their base value and their distribution. Also, we consider the correlation between some parameters. For example, we set the correlation uh, it to be negative between the price of GIS equipment and their equipment fault rate. And during the calculation, we discovered that the social cost of carbon is highly sensitive parameters in this BCA. And we should note that the lower the social discount rate, the wider distribution and higher values of the SCC. In our study, we set two social cost of carbon scenarios. The low SCC means that we adopt the suggested level and distribution like the gray areas on the left. This is similar to the 2.5% discount rate level in the US Integrity Working Group. And the highest CC is from a recent estimation from Rick that um, in nature climate change, the medium level of the carbon dioxide per ton is around $400, not the $75 in the lowest CC case. The main reason for this high estimation is that the damage function are updated and quantitatively reflect much wider coverage of the social damages from global warming. The main results will be summarized in the following slides. So first for the standard BC, we set each parameter to its base value and then calculate the costs and benefits. Firstly, on the private costs for the firms, the equipment costs are the major ones and are quite different across three schemes. Scheme one and two both include the additional costs of investing in the new GIS. However, scheme two also includes the cost of scrapping the old GIS and for skin three, the equipment costs only come from the ritual fitting cost, which is much smaller. All schemes have almost the same cost of buying the alternative gases because the volumes of GIS across schemes are the same. Other cost components are relatively small. And altogether, re equipment replacement has the highest cost, followed by the green investment. Gas replacement, although still at the R&D stage, is least costly. In general, this also shows that if we were pricing the environmental externality of SF6, firms will have high private costs for the deployment of the alternative gas, and they will do, do not do this type of investment. But once we consider social benefit together with this private cost, things become quite different. Now the great bars are the total private cost that we have shown. 
and the green bars are the base case estimation of social benefits under the low SCC scenarios. Besides, as we mentioned before, the recycle rate of SF6 during the GIS decommissioning will influence the social benefits. We find that when recycle rate is high, it will generate very small social environmental benefit, shown as the light green dot. And on the contrary, when the SF6 is poorly recycled at decommissioning, the social benefit will become much larger, as shown by the dark green dot. This result points to the importance of considering um, the regulatory terms for recycle in the real world. Here, the light blue mark shows the net present value when everything sets at the base case. Green investment and gas replacement can achieve positive MPV. And meanwhile, due to the huge equipment cost of the scheme to it is the, it has negative MPV. However, if we consider the scenario with a much higher SCC, no matter on the low or high recycle rate, the social benefit becomes much larger. The base case MPVs all becomes very positive and very large. And next, we allow all parameters uncertainties. We conduct a Monte Carlo simulation in which all parameters simultaneously change according to their distributions. The simulation results are plotted in this figure. Firstly, we can see that when considering uncertainties of all parameters, the net benefits have wide distributions. Secondly, on the low SCC, skin one and three have a large probability to be positive. However, for skin two, the net benefit is hardly ever positive. Thirdly, when we use F, High SCC, the relative rankings are still the same, but will have very high probability to result in positive net benefits. Then to examine the influence of parameters one by one, we use a one-way sensitivity, sensitivity analysis. Here we present the results for the green investment scheme. We allow the change of one parameter while setting others at their base value, and then we calculate the net benefit. The top 10 influential factors are listed here. On the low SCC, several parameters are very sensitive and can flip the results. The recycle rate, the discount rate, the volume of GIS can flip the results. And then again, when the SCC is high, all these bars are on the positive range, meaning that there is no, not even one parameter that are sensitive enough to flip the result and the positive net social benefit conclusion will be robust. Here comes to our conclusion. Firstly, the standard BCA result indicates that if we adopt the current level of the social cost of carbon values recommended for regulatory analysis, we are able to achieve positive net benefits and mitigating SF6 emission by the green investment and Promoting a GIS retrofitting screen. Replace the current GIS will lead to the net, net, negative net benefits. However, if we use a much higher SCC, all schemes will achieve positive net benefits. And secondly, when we take into account the uncertainty of the BCA parameters, the net benefits of investing in the environmental friendly GIS have higher variabilities. The relative rankings of these schemes are robust. And thirdly, we identify the most important parameters influencing such variabilities. The most important one is the choice of SCC. Of, and our case is an example where such decision will largely impact the positive or negative conclusions. Then the real world compliance or recycling and the relative price of alternative gas and SFX equipment are also crucial parameters. If for policy purpose, we have to live with a relatively small SCC, then our results suggest for contextual specific regulations. For example, in contexts where there is high institutional capacity and can do the recycle very well by strong monitoring and enforcement, then it may be a good choice to keep using SF6 in the near term and wait for the cost reduction of alternative gas technologies. However, for contests with weak institutions and doom poor recycle compliance, then it would be beneficial to immediately replace SF6 by alternative gas. 
And lastly, um, our type of analytical framework is very useful. It can be easily applied to economic analysis for other low carbon technologies and can inform the future decarbonization. And the above is our presentation and we can open for discussion now. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, does does yeah. your research uh, related to the current Chinese policy about yeah. uh, power industry? Yeah. Okay. Then the obvious question goes to what, what about just abandoning all those SF6 usage using a new, um, you know, other devices or uh, gases? And then well, but your uh, research says that it's, it's, not, it's not a good uh, way to do that, right? Well, I think um, we have to consider uh, uh, the benefits of the private sector because they are the one who uh, have to pay for this kind of abandoning their own equipment. So I think if we want to promote this kind of um, abandon of the uh, in-service equipment, we have to make compensations for those firms, but there will be a huge cost. I think uh, this kind of solution in, can be uh, used in the near future because uh, now in China, those in-service uh, devices had only been put into uh, service for like 10 years, but actually their design lifetime will have uh, thir uh, 30 years. So there would be a huge waste. But I think in countries where uh, there are uh, in-service devices that has been uh, used for a long time, it would be a good choice. And is that, can, can this um, answer to your question? Yeah, of course, yes. Because yeah. well, in Korea, if we, we mm. talk about the case of Korea, we try to develop mm. a, a new gas Okay. to uh, change and it seems like uh, one of the uh, uh, government research institution was successful to have one mm -hmm. so that they try to replace pretty much every uh, SF6 to uh, new gases uh, okay. to reduce quite a lot of uh, burden to the industry from the industry yes so uh, 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 I was wondering if you could say if someone wants to as a gear government uh, changes all the gases, SF6 gases, to uh, better ones, even though it costs a lot, maybe the, the China as a whole country might have uh, more benefit for the, uh, I don't know, about the other industry to emit more CO2 instead of uh, the uh, power industry. Because your, your analysis is just within the, uh, the power industry, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so what if you it is, extend to uh, other manufacturing industry like uh, semiconductor electronics or other, uh, I don't know, uh, steel making companies and others who wants to emit more CO2, then um, this might be a better choice to reduce CO2 uh, in, from the uh, power industry, even though it costs a lot? Well, I think it is because um, we have, there are lots of research that will lay their stress on their carbon dioxide gases as they're the most, it is the most familiar greenhouse gases to all. But actually for uh, those non-carbon dioxide uh, greenhouse gases like SF6, their um, potential damage to our climate is so far unknown. They are, it is like um, a close discussion in their power industry in previously, but now we lead it uh, into the economic field so that at least people can notice this kind of question, not just the uh, carbon dioxide. I think this is our starting point. Yeah, actually, uh, we have a question from Regina again. Yeah. That says, Switzerland, they have two producers, AB, ABB and Schneider, uh, and uh, somebody, uh, uh, was successful to create a new one, but then no demand yet for the, you know, Swiss electric, electric utilities. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess it's quite similar to, uh, to the case of China, right? In Korean case, uh, the utility companies, all the power industries are actually owned by the government. So the government itself is trying to force all the uh, power company to change, or at least to try to find some alternatives, even though it costs a lot. Mm -hmm. So that might be a question, not you know, for, for Regina a little bit about the case of Korea, but how do you think about it, about Chinese case here? Do you think there will be a demand for, uh, even though it's low low scenario, do you, do you think that there would there be any demand if there is any uh, new equipment or new gas uh, uh, from the uh, Chinese power companies? Well, actually, from our research on uh, the commercialization uh, neutrality goes um, from China. Uh, at the first day, we will the company will uh, look more at the mitigation of their uh, uh, carbon dioxide at first, and then they will move on to the non-carbon dioxide greenhouse gases. I think by that time there will be demand for replacing or retrofitting equipment that is using the SF6 gas. Um, I think the case in Switzerland, we have to discuss this uh, case by case as we, that's why we will um, calculate and analyze um, cases under different schemes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Would there be any other questions about uh, any presentations for this session? I'll just wait a couple of more minutes, see if there's any other questions and then we'll wrap up the session. Hmm. Thing is that we still have 30 more minutes left. And there's no question or questions or discussions whatsoever. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, wish I could uh, visit Wuhan again. I actually visited one university a couple of years ago, but then I bet, I bet that you had really a hard time for the last couple, couple of years, I guess. Hope, you, uh, hope we could uh, meet together sometime. Thank you. Thank you for all the speakers and participants of this session. Even though we have 30 minutes left, uh, I guess there will be nothing left to discuss. Thank you very much. Uh, we will wrap up the session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. It seems like we have 30 minutes left, but then <laughs> not many questions. <laughs> yeah, it happened. At least, uh, at least uh, each presentation has 30 minutes. So, yeah. um, at least for the video part, it will be okay. They will have the, the good right. timing, everyone. And normally it happens with three presentations. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, but this was a very interesting um, session, by the way. And thank you again, Mr. Hu, for yeah, this. Yeah, uh, papers this were session. really interesting, especially that Bitcoin thing. It's. <laughs> 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 exactly. I mean, all, all three presentations were really nice. Yes. Okay. So um, okay. I'll wrap you. up the session here from my side. I'll just stop to record. Yes, please. And, yes. And I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.